University of Medicine and Pharmacy from Republic of Moldova. Welcome at the State of Art Lecture with the topic Facing the COVID-19 Pandemic, the Virologist Point of View that will be held by Professor Alessandro Marcello, that is the group leader of the Molecular Virology Laboratory of the International Center of Genetic Engineering and Biotechnology in Trieste, uh, Italy. It's a great pleasure for me to introduce Professor Marcello because of his impressive research background, but also because he started his research in a very dear topic for me in biochemistry. But further, his research area broadened very much. He moved to molecular biology, microbiology, virology, and today Professor Marcello is aiming his studies in human viruses studying that at the level of structural and functional genomics, but also proteomics. And lately this year, due to unusual situation of COVID-19 pandemic, his team is aiming the research on SARS-CoV-2. Dear Professor Alessandro Marcello, we are very glad to welcome you at the anniversary congress of Nikolai Testimitsanu State University of Medicine and Pharmacy on behalf of the academic community of the university but also of the medical community of Moldova. I express my highest appreciation for your acceptance to present us the results of the research of your team and to share the uh, your expertise in this domain with us. Please, you can start your presentation and at the end we will be very grateful for your answer to the questions of the attendee of this uh, state-of-the-art lecture. Thank you. So I don't hear anything from you, so mm -hmm. uh, I will start in any case and uh, I will put the screen show. Science and biotechnology uh, for the benefit of our member states, including Moldova. Moldova became a member state very recently, but still we had a very good collaboration during this last uh, month, and I'm really happy to be able to, to interact with you more in the future. As I mentioned, I'm 
uh, head of the Green TS and basically <coughs> what we do and what we did until March this year was to work on uh, viral replications on different viruses including HIV, hepatitis C, flaviviruses uh, basically at the basic level where we're interested in viral replication and the host cell response at the applied level developing diagnostic tools for surveillance and developing antiviral drugs and then looking at emerging viruses and mechanisms of action of drugs. This year, everything, of course, changed. We have a new virus, SARS-CoV-2. So all the lab has been redirected towards research on this virus. Here in the picture, my collaborators, uh, I couldn't, couldn't have done anything without them. They have been really uh, very great collaborators, very helpful during this, this, uh, these months. Research during this period has been tough. I'm particularly working on the virus, and I'm very grateful to them for their continuous uh, support and uh, dedication to the work. So, what happened? What happened in, in February? Uh, we had uh, the epidemic hitting hardly in Italy, and since uh, the 1st of March, we had cases also here in uh, Trieste, where our headquarters are based. <clears throat> so, we immediately initiated operation in virology because we are virologists we know how to culture the virus we know how to work with the virus and we set up a list of priorities to handle this uh, this crisis not only for us in terms of our own interest in science but also for supporting uh, first of all our country italy uh, in this in this uh, hard moment but also uh, all our member states if possible uh, to support them in in this context so we did divide the priority of activities in different phases. Phase one was the most urgent and was to support basically the molecular characterization of uh, circulating SARS-CoV-2. So we didn't know what kind of genomes were circulating and how they would evolve in time. Development of molecular tools for, for SARS-CoV-2 detection. Uh, these are being developed very early by PCR, but uh, have been implemented by different ways. Development of serological tools for SARS-CoV-2 detection, also to study the immune response, and importantly, repurposing of drugs against SARS-CoV-2. These are drugs that are, are used for other diseases and can be repurposed against this virus. Uh, phase two, in fact, uh, it was mostly uh, uh, focusing on development of tools for rapid testing, so development of diagnostic uh, for point of care, development of specific antiviral drugs, not only repurposing, but also specific to viral uh, activities. This infection procedure, this is something that has been uh, overlooked a lot, but uh, I think uh, it's very critical now uh, to provide ways of disinfecting the environment in, in different public places to allow uh, normal operation in this context. And then, of course, the definition of mode of action of antiviral drugs this is more related to research and how the, uh, the drugs work uh, in uh, inhibiting the virus, and also understanding the cell response to infection. This is, again, our basic interest in virus host interactions. Immediately, uh, we set up a, a web page. This is uh, shown here, where we share resources that we develop in our laboratory and in our components, so not only in Tiesta, but also in Delhi, Cape Town. Whatever we develop, we make it free and freely available to our member states and also to whom is interested. And we provide uh, reference in this web page, including technical assistance and uh, updates on our activities. So, one of the critical elements of uh, working with a pathogenic virus such as SARS CoV 2 is the availability of a containment laboratory, of level 3 laboratory. This is our laboratory here in Trieste is a negative pressure containment laboratory for the manipulation of class 3 pathogens. Uh, we uh, dedicated one room entirely to the work with uh, SARS-CoV-2. Uh, we enhanced safety measures, including full face masks with uh, respirator, with uh, disposable filters and uh, various uh, protection, uh, disposable protection uh, measures. And we revised all the, the, the contamination procedures and operational procedures. This allowed us to start immediately handling the virus from uh, infected patients here in Trieste 
we collected samples from basically swabs from uh, people that were diagnosed as positive by a TPCR in our um, hospital. And we inoculated these uh, uh, swabs into Vero cells to grow uh, the, the virus. And we succeeded in, in growing several of these samples and immediately sequenced them. So we performed full genome sequencing of uh, uh, viral isolates. And these were among the first uh, sequences in Italy uh, dedicated to the virus circulating in Italy. Because you have to keep in mind that in Italy, we had a few, very few cases uh, early on in January. And these were people traveling from China, a couple of Chinese tourists, some Italian coming from China. And these were infected basically with a Chinese strain and were isolated in Rome. But actually, the epidemic that hit uh, Italy late in February was actually coming from a different source, was coming from uh, viruses that are circulating in probably in Germany and hit northern Italy. And so it was it critical to understand which was the, uh, the, the, the virus circulating at that time in northern Italy. And we, sequenced, we started with four sequences, four full genome sequences, and, uh, uh, which we could map uh, to clade G which uh, was, again, uh, was prevalent in the EU and Northern Italy. So this is uh, a, a clay that was circulating in, uh, in, certain, in Europe at the time. <coughs> and this activity allowed us to start uh, characterizing the genomes uh, in, in Italy, and we are continuing to do so for Italy and also for our member states. And uh, in particular, we uh, collaborated with uh, our uh, colleagues in Moldova to uh, sequence uh, local isolates. And this is particularly important because we need to have a map, a geographical distribution of the, uh, the genetic evolution of the virus in different countries. And we support this activity by providing uh, a platform for sequencing here in Trieste for our samples from our member state. And Moldavia uh, sent us uh, uh, five, four samples that are shown here uh, in this table and we stick to them all. And uh, as you can see from the table, these are all clay GR, so it's an evolution of clay G, uh, compared to another group of full genome sequences also uh, published from, uh, from Moldova, coming from Moldova. You can see that uh, isolates that were made in March, so early March in Moldova, were mostly clay G, as we observed in Italy as well while uh, isolates that were uh, later on in the, in, the, in the epidemic, like uh, those in June that we sequenced, are in the clade GR. So it's an evolution of the clade. Clades are defined by specific mutations. And here are shown the mutations that induce uh, amino acid changes in the viral proteins. In particular, you can observe that uh, uh, with all these uh, uh, clades, uh, except for the clade V shown here, they all carry the so-called D614G mutation in the spike protein. This mutation is very common and increasingly uh, and widely distributed uh, uh, among uh, uh, viral isolates. Uh, you can see here the, uh, the prevalence of the different clades uh, in the world, in, in Europe actually, in the last uh, few months. And you can see that, for example, clay G is the green line, was the most prevalent. Now it's a bit decreasing in favor of GR, <coughs> which is uh, clearly uh, you can see here uh, reflected also the, in our sequencing here in Moldova and also in, in, in Italy. If you look at the, uh, the, the, the mutations of the, uh, that have been uh, observed in, in SARS-CoV-2 in the last uh, six, seven months, of the epidemic, uh, you can observe that uh, apart from the D614G mutation, which is which became really prevalent among the viral isolates, there are other mutations that are uh, becoming prevalent in the in the in, in the virus circulating in the world uh, worldwide. And these include mutations, for example, in the N protein shown here. This is a characteristic of the GR uh, clade and other mutation in other different proteins. But what is the, this, the impact of, what is the significance of this mutation in terms of the, of the uh, virus biology? Well, we don't know much about them except probably for the uh, most uh, characterized one, which is the, again the T614G. Uh, 
and they could prove to be relevant for the pathogenesis, but so far we don't know much about them. Concerning D614G, this is a mutation in the spike protein. The spike protein is the surface, uh, the surface glycoprotein uh, decorating the membrane of the virus, and the, which is uh, critical for uh, binding the AC2 receptor and internalization of the virus uh, in the infected cell. Uh, is uh, this protein is a trimer on the viral surface, and the mutation does not impact the, the uh, binding with the receptor. So it's not a mutation that affects binding to the receptor. It's a mutation that appears to relax a little bit the uh, structure, allowing, uh, and this is uh, still, uh, uh, let's say, uh, in progress in terms of uh, scientific characterization, uh, to uh, make this conformation to make it more uh, likely to increase the chance of infection. So here uh, I've shown you right here noise. Is that a problem? Is that a problem? Okay. So I carry on. So I, I was saying that this uh, mutation apparently relaxes the structure of the virus, uh, of the glycoprotein, and in the experiment shown here from this paper in Cell that appeared recently, uh, there is an increase of infectivity in the mutant spike. These are in vitro experiments, so we still have to understand uh, exactly what happens in vivo, but uh, there is some, some indication that this mutation can increase in the, uh, infectivity, but does not increase uh, pathogenicity. But what is the, the relevance of uh, the virus mutating? I want to put this in, in, in perspective in terms of vaccine development. So if you, this is a, a nice, uh, uh, I found it a, a nice uh, picture that appeared in a, in a recent paper, uh, in a recent review, in a recent commentary, that uh, shows here that these, these balls that these, uh, uh, represent the variability of the virus. So how much variation there is in terms of sequence of different, different viruses. So if you see, for example, hepatitis C is highly variable. You have a number of variation of the virus uh, in, in circulating in the population. The same for influenza, the same for HIV. While other viruses are much, much, much less, let's say, uh, variant. And in particular, SARS-CoV-2 so far has been shown to mutate quite slowly compared to other viruses. And this is due probably to the proliferating activity, and so we still have to understand uh, what is making this virus less prone to, to mutations. But uh, this is what we observed uh, so far in terms of uh, mutations appearing in, in this virus. But what is the implication of this observation for a vaccine? Well, it's good news if you consider that, uh, uh, for example, of all the vaccines that have been uh, developed successfully for viruses, shown here in blue, those with a, a lower variability appear to be much more successful than those against high variable viruses. For example, we have very effective vaccines for mumps, uh, hepatitis B or measles, but much, much less efficient for HIV or hepatitis C, while for influenza, okay, this is a seasonal, seasonal uh, vaccine and the efficacy, the, the, the efficacy sometimes is not uh, 100%. So, uh, it's, it's good news that the virus is not mutating so frequently, and this would allow probably the development of a successful vaccine. However, we have to keep in mind one thing that is critical. This virus is, uh, is, is, is uh, infecting, it's now prevalent in a very naive population, so uh, it's circulating in humans for the first time, so there is no immune response to this virus. We will see uh, uh, time in the next uh, years how the virus evolves in phase of an immune response to the virus. So there may be changes uh, maybe in the spike protein or other proteins that uh, uh, impact the virus circulating in a population that is established in some kind of immunity, either uh, natural or to a vaccine. So this we will see. Uh, concerning uh, a Vaccine development, uh, uh, I personally don't work much on vaccines. Uh, uh, we do some work on uh, other approaches, in, uh, immunological approaches, and there are two approaches that are quite quite relevant. Uh, the first is to use the use also of uh, convalescent plasma. This means uh, um, serums or derived from patients that, uh, sort of, that are already recovered from, uh, from the infection. 
and this uh, uh, serum contains antibodies, uh, antibodies against the virus and can be used to neutralize the virus in another, in another individual. Uh, this, uh, this graph here shows the seroconversion of a specific individual that uh, was infected by SARS-CoV-2 uh, on the 23rd of March black bar, so the, viral, the, uh, the, the serum was not neutralizing the virus. These are increasing concentration of, uh, uh, so this is a, a dilution of uh, serum in the presence of the virus. Uh, and then in time, you can see that after a few days, you had full cell conversion and uh, yeah, the, the, uh, um, the formation of neutralizing antibodies, you can see that the serum at, after, let's say, a week, is fully neutralizing the viral infection, and the serum can be used in a in a in a uh, in a therapy option as a therapy option. Another uh, similar option, more safe probably, is to use recombinant antibodies. Uh, we also we all know that the president of the United States has been treated with uh, a cocktail of recombinant antibodies against SARS-CoV-2 developed by Regeneron. Uh, these are targeting the receptor binding domain of the spike protein and probably uh, at, at two different locations and neutralize the infection. And these can be administered uh, intravenously and are more safe than convalescent plasma therapy, of course, because they are purified and uh, have a much, much better safety profile. We characterized a number of uh, patients uh, developing uh, uh, SARS CoV uh, that were infected by SARS CoV 2 and developing disease. Um, we tried to establish a correlation between uh, antibodies against the receptor binding domain, which is a specific portion of the spike protein re required for the binding of the receptor. And uh, uh, we could observe that, that there is a good correlation between uh, IgG response towards this uh, RDP, RBD domain uh, uh, with the uh, neutralization ability of the virus. For example, uh, if you have <coughs> Uh, high, uh, high titers of, uh, um, of, let's say, for example, here, uh, of uh, IgGs against the receptor binding domain. Uh, this is uh, a high titer of IgGs and corresponds to a high titer of uh, neutralization. However, this is not always, always the case. There are some cases where you have, we can really observe neutralization. For example, in this case, we observe very good neutralization while you see a very poor binding to the, to the RPD domain. And basically what we found is that uh, there are some neutralization domains that are not at the level of the RPD. So there are other portions of the spike protein that uh, are, uh, can be targeted uh, for neutralization. Um, so far so good. So this is the immunological part. Now I will uh, close by showing you some data on the development of uh, antiviral strategies. So uh, this is a virus, uh, this is an RNA virus that infects the cells, uh, enters the cells. There is fusion and uncoating of the viral RNA. It's a positive st stranded viral RNA, which then is translated and, and replicated in the cytoplasm at the level of the ER, creating this kind of double membrane vesicles, harboring the replicating virus. The, the RNA is then packaged into an enveloped uh, particle that is released by, by the cell. There are several targets for therapy that can be exploited against this virus. I already described to you the, the use of monoclonal antibodies, for example, or plasma therapy, which not the infection at the level of uh, entry of the virus. But you have uh, a number of other uh, targets and, and putative uh, antiviral drugs being developed. You know all about, uh, for example, chlorokine. Uh, that is uh, targeting the endocytic uh, pathway. Or, uh, for example, opinavirinitonavir, these are anti protease inhibitors of uh, the HIV that show, have shown some activity against uh, the viral protease, uh, although they are not used in therapy now because they are ineffective. What is effective is remdesivir, and remdesivir is, uh, is an inhibitor of the RNA dependent RNA polymerase and appears to be effective also in vivo and is used currently as an antiviral drug for therapy. This is an example of repurposing. In fact, uh, the Demisivir was uh, developed for other viruses and found to be active also for, uh, for SARS-CoV-2. But how do you uh, uh, identify novel drugs, particularly drugs for repurposing? Well, there are two 
basic strategies, uh, let's say a top-down approach and a bottom-up approach. So starting from the bottom-up approach, you can have uh, uh, studies related to identifying cellular factors involved in bioreplication. So you can use uh, large screenings uh, like NAI or CRISPR screenings, which are lots of function screenings or, or gain of function screening by, by transfecting or overexpressing different uh, studies related to interactome studies. So these are protein-protein interaction networks, and these all give you an idea of what are the cellular pathways involved uh, in the viral replication. Uh, this is a good example of this is this large work uh, by the Krogan network of uh, people. Uh, they basically did a proteome uh, study where all the uh, SARS-CoV-2 proteins were cloned and tagged and expressed in hex cells, purified uh, together with the associated cellular factor, and this allowed to establish a protein-protein interaction, interaction map uh, by mass spectrometry analysis. And the identification of uh, around 60 ligands uh, and uh, the, the matching of these ligands with approved investigation of preclinical drugs allowed to identify a couple of <coughs> critical pathways and associated drugs to be uh, candidates for repurposing in the face of uh, the SARS-CoV-2 infection. So this is a kind of approach, a bottom-up approach. We undertook uh, a different approach, which is a more classical top-down approach, where you uh, rely on uh, libraries of uh, drugs that are being already approved for clinical use for different diseases, uh, and uh, or drugs from traditional medicine or herbal extracts and other natural compounds. So all these, of course, uh, uh, can be tested on a screen of viral infectivity or viral replication. And uh, uh, then, of course, you have, uh, uh, although you may find an inhibitory drug, you still have to find what is the target of the drugs in terms of uh, how it inhibits viral replication while for the bottom-up approach. You know the target, but the, you lack the drug, or at least uh, you have to look for the drug. So these are the, in, in, in general terms, the, the, how you approach uh, antiviral uh, drug development. And we approach this in our, in our context uh, because we have the virus available. So as I told you before, we isolated the virus from patients here. So we have this isolate showing clear cytopathic effect in cell. We have uh, an assay, and the assay can be either a standard plaque assay, which allows you to count the number of infectious viruses, or a more high throughput uh, assay. That this is our high throughput uh, laboratory where we can uh, measure infected cells by looking at the uh, spike uh, production by immunofluorescence. And this is an example of infected cells with an antibody against the spike that we developed in our in our laboratory. So by this screening, we can uh, approach uh, different uh, drugs. So we, we, we did several screenings uh, of uh, several drugs uh, that can be used for repurposing. I'm going to show you here some examples of those that were most advanced in terms of uh, antiviral activity. So the first example is, uh, is a drug called Miclustat. This is an uh, immunosugar. And this drug uh, was already identified uh, uh, some years ago as an inhibitor of uh, HIV, HIV uh, replication. Um, this drug is an inhibitor of uh, alpha glucosidases and uh, glucosyl transferase activity, so <coughs> it actually affects glycosylation of protein in the ER. Glycosat is used to treat uh, genetic disorders uh, such as uh, Gaucher or Neiman Peak type C diseases. These are very rare and infrequent diseases. However, there is a protocol for clinical use of this drug, that so it actually can be used in patients. Uh, we found that Miglustat inhibits SARS-CoV-2 in vitro, so here you, should, you see a, a curve of inhibition uh, with an IC50 in the micromolar range, low micromolar range, and the void of cytotoxicity, so the red line is the cytotoxicity. And we confirmed this in our another assay in other cells by immunofluorescence showing that uh, uh, cells treated with the drug are completely uh, spike negative. As I said, this drug is, can be repurposed 
However, the pharmacokinetic uh, uh, of the drug in vivo with the uh, uh, concentration used for clinical use uh, are more or less at the level of the IC50. So you would have, you would prefer to have a drug with a, a, a lower IC50 to be to be active in this context. So probably pro process progressing towards uh, clinical use of the specific drug will not be uh, reasonable to do, but uh, it represents a class of inhibitors that may have good potential against uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, and not only SARS-CoV-2, because this, these drugs are pleiotropic in terms of antiviral activity. They inhibit a number of different viruses, not only HIV and SARS-CoV-2, but also dengue, for example, and other viruses. Another example is a collaboration with a, a company in, uh, in Italy, it's called Panoxivir. This company already developed uh, a strategy based on metabolites of cholesterol, in particular, 27 hydroxy and 25 hydroxy cholesterol have been shown to have antiviral activity, and they are uh, exploiting this activity for developing uh, nasal sprays for uh, uh, common cold uh, viruses. So these are uh, metabolites of cholesterol. They are naturally found in our in our organism. And interesting enough, if you look at the graph uh, here on the bottom right, uh, if you look at patients that are COVID patients and you stratify them in terms of uh, severity of disease, you can see that the levels of 27 drugs in cholesterol decreases with the increase of severity. So there is a, a drop of this uh, uh, metabolite in uh, infected in, in COVID patients. And we found that 27, 20, 25, but also 27 on intoxic cholesterol inhibits SARS-CoV-2, which is an IC50 around 2 micromolar, and a good selectiv selectivity index. Interesting enough, this drug is also active against uh, a common cold coronavirus, or C43, which is already circulating in the human population, with a similar IC50. So this, are, again, is a drug that can potential for uh, for SARS-CoV-2, it's not a repurposing drug, a repurposed drug because uh, it is uh, a drug that is uh, not yet for clinical use, but is potential a potential biotropic inhibitor and broad spectrum inhibitor for for, for SARS-CoV-2 and other coronaviruses. Another example comes from India. We tested uh, herbal extracts uh, from, uh, from India using traditional medicine that have been already shown by our colleagues in Delhi to be active against other viruses such as dengue and chikungunya. We tested them for SARS-CoV-2 and these again were, uh, were uh, showing good uh, antiviral activity in vitro. And we are currently running a phase three clinical trial in India on COVID patients with this drug and we're expecting results very soon. So here's another example. These are uh, drugs uh, from traditional medicine. These are uh, complex mixture, but uh, show potential antiviral activity, again, with a broad spectrum, and uh, can be used also for the treatment of SARS-CoV-2 patients. Uh, finally, an example of a strategy for uh, more uh, high throughput screening. So here, in collaboration with the uh, group in Milan, we uh, did a silico drug screening, so there is a library of uh, uh, molecules that can be docked on the structure, in this case of the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. And by doing silico docking, you can select uh, uh, the best binders, and by further, further refinement, we ended up with a selection of uh, 13 molecules that were then tested for antiviral activity with our test. And some of them showed very good uh, antiviral potential. This is uh, an example of an uh, antipsychotic drug, Urazidol, that is very effective against uh, SARS-CoV-2. So uh, just to finish, uh, I want to mention another activity, which I think uh, is, is quite impo important and rather overlooked, which is uh, uh, support to uh, companies and initiatives to identify ways of sanifying the environment. Uh, critical, for example, cruise ship. Uh, there's a large company in Italy for the building of cruise ship. They had a big, big problems with the SARS-CoV-2. Uh, remember this process uh, problem and, and so on. And they want to develop sanification procedures for cruise ships, which uh, we are helping them to develop. 
and this could be applied not only to cruise ships but to, in the context of uh, sanitizing environments. And uh, other companies ask us uh, support for specific antiviral agents, specific uh, treatments like ozone or hydroxyproside or UV treatment, and also uh, laboratories for the uh, control of uh, bioweapons as our support for, for their activities. So I want to finish here. Uh, I want to thank a lot of people, and particularly uh, my group, as I already told you, my collaborators in different, uh, uh, different laboratories around Italy and a lot of uh, contributors in terms of financing because you got research without money and uh, uh, there was no grants for COVID uh, uh, in March when we started so we had to really look for resources whenever we could find them. So thank you very much for, for your kind invitation and I don't know if you have questions. I can't hear you very well so... I'm sorry, do you hear us now? You can't hear us, Professor? Angela, this is Latin. Also, do You can write me on the text. Of course. Can you, can you hear us? Okay, health immunity is at, the, at this moment, we don't have evidence of herd immunity at this point. So, uh, uh, one could speculate that uh, in the next years, there could be uh, an immunity uh, to this virus and, uh, let's say, uh, an attenuation of the, 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 the danger that this virus in the population. We have examples of other coronaviruses that circulate in the human population causing common cold diseases. <clears throat> so, they're not very pathogenic. They could have been adapted to the human population. But uh, talking about herd immunity after a few months of the infection is dangerous because we, you know, to reach uh, herd immunity, we need to have at least 60-70% uh, of the population uh, uh, with protective antibodies. And so far, the, uh, if you look at people who developed uh, severe diseases, you see very good immune response, good antibodies, good neutralizing activity. But if you look at uh, asymptomatic individuals, people who just uh, uh, are positive but uh, don't show any kind of symptoms, there the, uh, the antibody response is very, very weak and short-lived. So again, even counting the number of positives is not uh, sufficient to tell you how much protection in terms of immunity you have. So uh, I think I tend to agree to the point that it's dangerous to, uh, to talk about herd immunity at this stage. Okay. Uh, well, there is, a, as you all know, a race in, uh, of different companies for a vaccine. Uh, what is the, the likely scenario is that there will be more than one vaccine available. So, from different companies with different protocols. Uh, this is not unusual because, for example, for influenza, we have different companies with different kind of viral, uh, approaches and uh, uh, different uh, vaccine uh, protocols available. Uh, the point here is that, uh, of course, now we are trying to complete phase three to make this uh, vaccine available. Uh, this vaccine will not be available for everybody very soon. I mean, to produce the, the number of doses of vaccine that are necessary for the population of the world will take a lot of time. 
And so I don't expect to see a vaccine available for the, the population in, in very shortly. Initially, there will be a certain category at risk that will be protected and then others. The point is that still the, the, the protocol for the vaccine needs to be established. We need to know how long is the protection going to be uh, active because we know that uh, even people who had a very good immune response uh, tend to the immune response tend to fade in time. So also the vaccine will have the same problem. So we need to establish the number of uh, boosts that we need to for the immunization, how long the vaccine is going to be protective, and, and so on and so forth. So uh, yes, there will be more than one vaccine available, uh, and we will see in time the next years, how they are going to be protected. Okay, so for, for, for this emergency, what we are using most frequently is that uh, all the sequences are deposited in a, in a, in a, in a, in a public uh, uh, repository, which is called GSA. <coughs> And uh, uh, GZ8 uh, then sends this uh, sequences to a, 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 a another public repository which is called the next train. I wrote it in the in the text. Uh, if you go to this uh, website, so it's nexttrain.com or dot org, I don't remember, but you, you find it easily on the net. There, all the sequences are um, are uh, shown. In terms of phylogenetic tree. So you have a real uh, real time uh, vision of how the virus is evolving in the different countries. So it's quite helpful in terms of uh, understanding the evolution of the virus and the virus sequences. So, uh, again, there is an evolution in terms of test. Uh, the, the first, the gold standard for, uh, for SARS-CoV-2 testing is RT-PCR. Uh, with that test, you can really detect uh, also very low amounts of virus uh, in, in the individual. Uh, what is now emerging is, yes, of course, okay, you can detect the virus, but what is the threshold when the virus is infectious? So how can you say if a person is, is, infect, is, is actually transmitting the virus? What is the threshold of viral load for transmitting the virus? So it, it appears that uh, uh, when you have CT's values, the CT is a value of the, of the RT-PCR. So the higher the CT, the, the lower the viral load is, so the less the viral RNA is present. So CT is above 30 then you really have virus that is basically not infectious. And I know that because we, uh, we inoculate uh, swabs from individuals of different CT. And I know from experience that if you I, I inoculate viruses, uh, swabs from uh, people that have CTs around 20, 25, I, can, I, I usually can, I can, can, uh, uh, can rescue the virus. So I can, I can isolate the virus. Mm -hmm. If I, I use, whenever we use the swabs uh, with uh, um, CTs above 30, we never, we, we've never been able to, 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 uh, to isolate the virus from on the cell. So this means that, there, doesn't mean that the virus is not present, it means that it's very, very low, and so probably much, much less infectious. So coming back to the, to the tests, uh, uh, now we have uh, uh, antigen testing. Antigen testing is a test that you do on swabs again, but detects the viral, uh, the virion, so the viral protein. Uh, this test is, is uh, probably a bit less sensitive than uh, um, RT-PCR, but probably is more meaningful in terms of effectivity. So if you are negative with this test, probably some of, some of the negatives will be at high CT in an RT-PCR test. But, but those that are positive are probably, probably infectious and need to be quarantined. So uh, it's still evolving, uh, they will, you know, it will take time to understand what will be the threshold and what will be the sensitivity. 
but it's clear that uh, uh, it's also clear that some people harbor uh, are positive for a long, long time. But again, probably they're not really infectious. They have very, very low levels. So this is how we are orienting the context now. So for live screening, using antigen testing is recommended. If, for example, if you have, uh, uh, typically it's the school classes. If you have one case in a school classes, then of course you cannot quarantine the whole class for two weeks, then you know, it would be too much. So what we tend to do now is to take the class and do antigen testing for tomorrow everybody. So this will give you, and then go back to, to classroom. Yeah, okay. I will tell to Danilo Simone your, your uh, greetings. Uh, of course, we are, uh, we are already uh, collaborating with uh, the laboratories in, uh, in, uh, in Moldova and on the sequencing. We will start program on, uh, on the testing of, uh, of CIRA for, uh, for plasma therapy. And uh, uh, for any information, we are, we are here. Uh, we are not a diagnostic lab per se, so we don't run tests for the or for the health sector. This is done in the hospital. We provide mostly uh, we, we develop tests. We develop tests on, also on different techniques, like a lamp, for example, instead of uh, PCR. This is a technique that is an isothermal application. It's much less uh, complicated than doing a PCR. So we're trying to be more developing tests, developing tools, developing uh, biotechnology rather than running uh, routine testing. Okay, uh, dear Professor uh, Marcello, uh, thank you very much for your very valuable and uh, interesting uh, presentation and uh, I hope that all uh, our colleagues okay. uh, so. <laughs> so uh, Mariana will tape what I am uh, saying unfortunately we have these uh, issues with the sound so uh, we are extremely grateful for your presentation that brought to us the latest information uh, about the evolution of research in SARS-CoV-2 biology, but also in pharmacological approaches, uh, in prevention by vaccines, but also in treatment using different uh, medicines. and. Uh, we hope uh, that uh, finally the common efforts of all researchers from all over the world will uh, give the humanity a hope to overcome the uh, pandemic either by a vaccine or by efficient uh, epidemiological uh, measures or some uh, medicines. Anyway, we hope very much that the pandemic will be over and you will uh, be able to travel to Moldova. So we really are looking forward to see you at our university. But uh, in time, we are going to send you a small uh, gift that will be a gift of uh, recognition of your contribution to everything that you've done for our university and for uh, our medical community. Uh, thank you uh, very much. For your team.
Cârmă e de invităm sau o schită?